this is this is a very uh, uh, very important uh, very important lecture. This is a a, a pivotal uh, lecture. Um, so all the second part of the of the of the course we started with uh, wireless security. Uh, wireless security is quite related to cryptography, but now from if, with every lecture we're gonna cover one uh, type of uh, attacks okay, or uh, type of threats, okay, and how to uh, protect or how to prevent that. So we start with by the. Uh, uh, most important one, which is uh, the, the, the title of the lecture is software security. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, within uh, or among uh, all the types of attacks, uh, most of the attacks they rely on uh, having the uh, victim or the user uh, do something which might lead to uh, to, uh, to a successful attack. Okay, uh, like. If, if it is using malware, for example, the uh, the uh, the user needs to download the file, the execute the file uh, using social engineering, etc. Um, uh, password cracking it 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 it, uh, it needs or uh, it is based on the fact that the user picks a weak password. So most of the attacks are relying uh, are relying on some vulnerable uh, action that is done by the uh, by the user. Now in software security. Uh, it, the scenario is more um, is more common, basically easy to uh, to to, uh, to have, which is uh, basically a user if he is using a flawed version of a software or a flawed software. Okay. Now, by flawed software, what do we mean? We don't mean uh, a software uh, that contains mistakes. Okay. So, a flawed software or vulnerable software is a software which contains some details. I say details, they are not mistakes because the program might be working 100%. Okay? Usability and it is uh, uh, operational as they require. But it contains some details that might be exploited by an attack. Okay? So, um, so yeah, this is uh, uh, and we, we, we call, uh, I call the, the, the lecture protecting systems or protecting software systems, and the you know the most uh, common type of these type of vulnerabilities. So this small details that leads to exploitation, I call vulnerabilities. Okay, and uh, the most common one is uh, buffer overflow. This is why uh, in this lecture we focus on uh, on buffer overflow. So there are other types of vulnerabilities that we have. Uh, you know, integer overflow, string format, dangling pointers, racing condition, all, the, all these are um, weaknesses, weaknesses in software. When you write, when you write your code, you might end up having something like this, okay? Uh, and this, if you have one of these, an attacker might take advantage of that, and uh, it might compromise the, uh, the system, okay? Uh, but basically, integer overflow, string, uh, string format, then the point racing conditions, a yeah, proper racing condition not, but all these are vines of buffer, of, uh, of, of buffer overflow. Okay, so the the main idea is buffer overflow. This is why we will uh, take time to explain it. Um, yeah, so buffer overflow remains the principal method used to exploit software by remotely injecting malicious code. So the goal of the attacker here is to make <coughs> the target system, the target software, uh, it might be. Uh, uh, basically, software used by the uh, by the victim. Okay, um, so you will try to make that target software execute some code remotely. Okay? Because if you, as as an attacker, let's say, uh, can push a user in front of you to execute the code you want, this is a successful attack. Because you can make it, for example, uh, open a port, or you can make it um, give you a remote shell DOS, okay, remote DOS. Uh, so your goal, or the goal of the uh, of the attacker, is to inject some malicious code on the target uh, machine and get it executed. Okay. Uh, so it says it remains to be the crown jewel of attacks. Okay. Because of this, because all other attacks, let's say um, web application attacks, or uh, yeah, web application attacks. Uh, so typically, what they will do at the end. You will, for example, steal the session. You will, uh, uh, what? Uh, yeah, 
يعني get some confidential information about the server etc. But the, why this the, the buffer of is cron jewel of attacks because it uh, allow you to execute code on the uh, systems machine or the targets machine. Okay, uh, this is why it's a very uh, uh, serious one. Uh, it uh, the idea started. Uh, a little bit early, buffer overflow uh, in the 80s, but uh, uh, there were uh, a, a paper, uh, an article in 1996 called uh, Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit, and which set the yeah, real basics of, uh, of, um, of buffer overflow. Uh, now, buffer overflow, of course, it, uh, it is based on manipulating uh, assembly instructions, or taking advantage of a particular uh, set of assembly instructions. This is why um, uh, I will do a quick uh, review of uh, uh, assembly or the parts of the assembly that is uh, interesting to us here. Uh, so here, yeah, when you write your code, whether in, uh, let's say in C here, because Java will have another uh, format. If you, if you compile Java, do you obtain this? No, you obtain what? Byte code. Byte code. Set of uh, yani high level uh, yani instructions and these byte codes, how they are executed. Using, using the Java virtual machine. Okay, Java virtual machine, and at the end of the day, there will be assembly like this, but through the interpreter of the Java virtual machine. Uh, so basically, to execute code, for example, on Windows, uh, or Intel type of uh, processors or architecture, at the end of the day, you need to execute this. Okay, either, any, either it is interpreted or compiled or whatever, you need to do it. Anyway. Um, so, starting from uh, some C code, if you compile it, you obtain machine instructions, and those machine instructions will be executed when you launch the uh, ROM. Okay. Now, the part which is interesting to us here, here is the uh, function call. When you call uh, a function, basically when you move from one function to another. So here we have what? We have a, a main uh, function, and inside the main function, uh, we have a call to another function. So when you reach this level, basically what happens here, if you uh, executed these and then you reach here, basically the control flow will jump and come to here, right? Mm -hmm. So you will be here, you will execute everything here, and then after, uh, at the end, you return, and when you return, you come back here. So basically, buffer overflow, it takes advantage of this mechanism, calling, going somewhere else, and then coming back. Um, so functions are portions of code within a program that perform a specific task and that are relatively independent of the uh, remaining code. Yeah. Uh, yeah, function code. Now, how this mechanism, mechanism is done, the uh, calling function, it uses extensively the stack or the execution stack. So you know what is a you know what is a stack? Basically, the stack is a structure where you can uh, add and remove elements from the top. So either to push or to pop, you cannot uh, remove uh, any an element from the uh, from the bottom of the uh, of the stack. Uh, so basically, in order to remove uh, this this element, for example, you need to pop all the upper ones. Okay. Um, yeah. So how it is used in uh, in, uh, uh, in, fu in function calls? Uh, basically. At every myth, uh, function call, you will create a structure or a frame, we call the frame, in the stack. Okay. So as long as you are calling method, you will have frames and frames st stacking on top of the uh, on the stack. Okay. So this is uh, an example here. We have uh, a, a function called draw square. This is a graphical function to draw square. Okay. And to draw square, you need to draw uh, the four sides of the square. So at every side there's a line. So basically you need the uh, function draw line. So method or function draw square calls draw line. This is why uh, the uh, the frame for the draw square on the bottom of the stack and then on top of it we have the uh, uh, draw line uh, or the frame of the, uh, of the draw line. Um, yeah. Uh, when, you when you manipulate frames on the stack, you need uh, two uh, uh, important uh, registers or two important uh, pieces of information, which are the top of the stack. At every moment, you need to keep a track on the uh, top of the stack. You need to know where is the top of the stack because if you have an instruction, for example, push, you need to push it starting from the top of the stack. Okay? And you have the uh, frame pointer or the base pointer 
this pointer it, uh, it points in the middle of the frame and it will allow you to access uh, uh, local variables and parameters because uh, I didn't say uh, when we have a frame for, um, for every function it contains what? the frame the the yeah, information needed to execute that function so for example local variables uh, parameters uh, some context uh, some context information that's it uh, now the frame pointer which is the EBP uh, showed in the register uh, EBP okay uh, it points uh, somewhere in the uh, local variable so through it you can access any uh, local variable of the uh, of the function um, yes the instructions of the uh, the method is also saved in no, stack no they are not the instructions are stored in uh, in in uh, uh, in other memory uh, uh, area, just for uh, instructions. And uh, did you did you uh, try to open an executable? If you have an executable, that is it. Let's say Word. That is it. Did you try to open it? You will find what? Huh? Huh? Not really junk. So you you need the right tool. So, for example, you can use the uh, PE view. PE view. I, I will show. I, I, I'll show you how. What you when, when you open executable, you find what? Hmm. Um, hmm. It will, of course, anything will open. You find the uh, hexadecimal are bits. Everything is bits, right? So, but exactly uh, what you're gonna find? It will try to go through the same thing. Huh? Execute what inside this text file and when you let me let me let me show you. <coughs> so this is a software. This is software that uh, um, that um, and it opens executable. So, so it knows the format because it has, it has particular format. It's not just bits or bytes. It has particular format. So um, so it's a reverse engineer on that program. Not really. No, not really reverse because you know executable. This is a format for Windows. Okay. This is the executable format for Windows. And Windows, when they designed this format, they said, okay, it should start by this, then this, then this sections. Okay, it is composed of sections. Okay. So if you open, for example, here, um, let's open this. Yeah, this is executable. You will find something like this. So basically, you will have a, a, a DOS header. So in those headers here, you will have information about the executable, like uh, bytes, signature, bytes of last page. The signature is always the same. 5A, it stands for, uh, <coughs> I think, um, uh, ZW or something. Uh, the, the, these, uh, these two bytes of signature, it, uh, they are the two uh, initials of the guy who wrote this uh, for you. This is called basically the portable executable format, PE uh, format. Okay. So uh, you have checked some initial IP, etc. Uh, but if you move, then you will find yeah, image file header, number of section pointer, number of symbol, you see option header. Yeah. So this is this is information which is uh, which is uh, useful. Uh, you have uh, size of code. You have base of code. Base of data, image base, uh, file alignment, every, and in some information, uh, size of image, uh, and in some information, uh, uh, needed to execute the, uh, the the file. Now, what is what I wanted to uh, to, to show you is these sections. So see, all these are headers. You know, all these are headers. So are meta information with the, the size, the where it should be loaded, etc. But these are the Data, basically, what you have here. Dot text. This is the part that contains the uh, the instruction. So if you go here, you will find the all the assembly of the uh, of the uh, the executable. And then you have, for example, resources. Dot resources. This is where you have if the executable has an icon, icon or uh, some pictures, or some graphical user interface, etc. All those resource files will be here. Audio, for example, if it uh, it does a sound. For you find them here, okay? Then, uh, uh, yeah, these are location, some uh, things. Uh, so, when you execute this file, what will happen? Since we are talking about this, 
first reach the text. Huh? Maybe no. So when you double click on this file, what will happen? You need to create a process. Yeah. You need to create a process on the operating system. So you create a process and then uh, you create an image. So what you do, you take basically almost all of this and you load it into the RAM. Section by section. So for example, the uh, .text will be loaded in one section, which is the machine instruction, the assembly. Okay. So this is, and then you do a couple of uh, stuff in the, in the process and you'll be ready to execute. Okay. So uh, yeah, so the machine instructions, they are, they are here and then when they are loaded, they are loaded in the uh, corresponding section in, in, in the RAM. Um, but uh -huh. the stack is in the CPU or in the CPU? There's no memory. The only memory in the CPU is what? The CPU is not does not contain memory. Okay. So basically, the 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 uh, instructions will be in the RAM. When you load the process, it will be in the RAM. Okay. Uh, Okay. Um, yeah, this lower addresses. Yeah, basically. Uh, uh, one other thing is that the stack it is moving toward lower addresses. What does it mean? It means when you call, you have a function here. You call another function. Then you call another function. Now you are uh, incrementing the stack. You are pushing from the stack, and you are moving toward lower addresses. It's the opposite. Normally, it should be moving to the upper addresses, right? You start from lower addresses, then you uh, you allocate space, you go to the uh, higher addresses. But here it's the opposite. Why? Why is this? Because in the uh, the memory space of a process, okay, uh, of executable, you need two important type of uh, memory spaces. You need so this suppose this is the all the memory space of your process, okay, the di dynamic basically memory space, okay, because the, 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 the memory space for the executable, when it is loaded, it is already allocated, so it's static. Okay? But here, the dynamic one. So for example, if you need to allocate an array of size 1000, it, should be, it, it will be allocated where? The heap. The heap. When you allocate an array, for example, it will be in the heap. So basically, the dynamic space of a process, it is composed of two important parts, which are the uh, heap. Dynamic. And then the stack. And see here, uh, the uh, the heap it is allocated on one extreme of the uh, of the dynamic memory space, and the stack in another extreme. And such a way that the heap will be moving like this from lower addresses to higher addresses. Okay. And then the stack to to use to make use of the dynamic space in an optimal way. One will start from here. One will start from, will start from here, and then uh, they will be uh, moving toward the child. So this is to maximize the usage of the dynamic space. So this is why the stack is, is moving from higher addresses to lower addresses. Okay. So basically, uh, uh, here the stack is kind of inverse. Okay. Anyway, uh, so I needed to mention this because we will do some examples and uh, we'll use this. Yes. Uh, for example, if you have a 4 giga RAM yes. and you do a recursive call, uh -huh. you get an exception sometimes the buffer overflow. Means the all four gate cannot contain. Not buffer overflow. Not buffer overflow. Stack you will have uh, stack overflow. Yeah, stack overflow. Basically, all the space of the uh, for gig. stack. Not for gig. Okay. Not for gig. Okay. Not for gig. Or the stack. Yeah, the memory uh, space allocated for that process. Yeah, it's not for gig. You know, the RAM. Uh, you see, the RAM. Uh, you have half of it. Half of it for the kernel. The OS, half of it, and then you have the other virtual space is uh, allocated for the process, okay. but not all of it, of course, not all of it. But, uh, half. Um, yeah, so let's discuss this uh, interesting example. So here we have uh, a main function, and then we have uh, uh, that main function that calls another function here, and uh, you have that that other function. Here. So let's. Uh, um, so this is the frame for the main function. So we are in the position where we need to execute this instruction. You will call another function. So here, according to you, what will happen? Whenever you, uh, yeah, the uh, control flow comes here, 
What will happen? Exactly. Push a function into the stack. So push push a frame. The frame. Yeah. So the data related to that function into onto the stack. So if you open the assembly instructions at this function call, you will find this. You will find. Uh, this is, we are still here in the uh, uh, main frame, the frame of the uh, main function. Okay. So before calling here, you need what it does. Pushes the parameters one by one. Okay, so pushes uh, two, nine, and five. Okay, it will push them on this side. Okay, now then you have call the function here, g function means the address where the code of the function is. Okay. So when we do call function, what will happen here? It will jump. It will jump. Yeah. It will jump. But yeah, this is easy. Hand. This is the uh, straightforward part. But uh, think about what will happen when you finish the call. You need to do what when you finish the call? Yeah. Yeah. You need to come back here. Yeah. So in order to be able to come back here, you need to store yeah. the location where you are at that, uh, at that time so that you can come back. So, and where, where is it stored? So basically, we need to store this address, 500. 500, we need to store it so that when we finish with function, we need to come back. Okay? So 500 will be stored where here? So, this time. So basically, whenever you have call, call, it does two things. Call, it does two things. The assembly instruction of call. It will push the address of the thing you want to jump to into, or no, push the address of the current instruction. Pointer, EIP. So basically, it will take that value, the current IP, and will put it on the stack. And then it will jump. Two things. Push, so call is push and jump. Okay? So basically, uh, yeah, so we store the uh, we store the IP, basically, we put here 500, stored IP, EIP is the, this address, 500, so that we can come back. And then uh, this is the code you're going to have in the uh, uh, function. Uh, here in the function you have a push EBP, move EBP, ESP, what it does here, push EBP? So push EBP, it does what? It will take the value of EBP and put it on the stack, here. So why we do this? Why we do this? Huh? Why we do this? So basically we push the value of EIP there. Huh? Yeah, same thing. So basically, this is, this is the EBP of this function, uh, of the main function. Yeah. So we need to store it. So that when you come back, we have all the context. We can yani, resume execution normally in the main function. So here, uh, store uh, EVP and store, EV, uh, store EIP and store EVP, this is to store in the context. So that when you come back, you have all the information back to the previous state. Yes. Uh, why did you push it? the parameters? Because when you go in, you have to pop everything to get the parameters, right? You don't need, no. How do you, how do you access the parameters? This is the point, I mean, this is the point. Uh, see, next instruction, see. Move EBP ESP, what it does here? Move EBP ESP, uh, what is the source of the destination here? The destination is EBP. The destination is EBP, right? right. Yeah. So, move ESP into EBP. Yeah. So now, the new EBP is the current ESP. And the current ESP is what? It's here. Yeah. So now, if, after, after I do this instruction, EBP will be pointing there. Mm -hmm. And EBP, again, what's the meaning of EBP? Base pointer. The base pointer, this is the, uh, the, uh, the, the address allowing us to access the local variables. Mm -hmm. So you want to access 5 and 9 and 2, you don't pop this. You just, you, you just keep it there. You need to use the EBP and then you do a certain offset, yeah. plus mm -hmm. 8, plus 12, and you get your local variables. So this is the meaning of uh, of EBP. So, yes. Uh, before uh, changing the value of EBP, uh -huh. what was the address of EBP? It was somewhere here, in the middle, in the middle of the previous function. Okay. So that uh, allowed us to access the local variables of main function. Okay. Uh, so and then we do a couple of stuff. This sub ESP some value it does what? Uh, it subtracts some value from ESP. So when you subtract some value from yeah, ESP, so ESP is here, it becomes where? Uh, up. So basically, we are allocating the space into uh, mm -hmm. for the frame of the uh, of this function. Okay. So ESP basically would be would be somewhere here. Okay. ESP would be there. Okay. 
and then uh, all the others here, which EV X, ESI, EDI, basically the, 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 the goal here is to store the context. Store those values related to the main function so that when we finish, we can retrieve them. Okay. And this is done on this slide. Anyway, so this is how, how it works. Now, at the, uh, when you return, these are the instructions when you finish. When you finish function, basically you do the opposite. So what we do here? Pop EDI, pop ESI, pop EVX. Basically, the, the values we stored on the stack, now we are retrieving them. Because we are ready to come back. Okay? So restoring the context. Okay? And then uh, move the ESP EVP here. The uh, ESP, it was here. Now, since, since you are done with this function, we need to pop it. We need to pop the frame, on the frame. So this, uh, this instruction does this. Move uh, uh, ESP EVP, basically. The ESP was here, now it becomes here. We popped it. Okay? Then, according to you, uh, the next instruction, pop EVP. Pop EVP. So pop EVP, what it does? Pop. So pop, basically, it will take the top of the stack, okay? take that value, and put it on the, uh, the argument of that pop. So take the top of the store EVP, and put it into EVP. We are storing the old value of EVP. This is the EVP of the main function. Okay? Then, return. No, return, it does one thing. Uh, uh, it does two things, let's say. It, it, it does two things. Okay. It will pop some value from the stack and it will jump to that value. Oh, so yeah, after after we did pop EVP, basically we are here now. Okay, now the top of the stack is the old EIP. Basically the value of here. What's value here? 500. So basically we take that value and we jump to it. And then we we uh, basically the goal is to come back to the main function. From the return, we need to come back here, okay? And this is exactly what, what is done by the, by the return, okay? So this is the, <laughs> the mechanism, this is the mechanism of um, uh, function calls, okay? Um, yes? The ESP points uh, to the uh, highest element in our stack? Yes. Always. Top of the stack. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so let's uh, now talk about the, uh, the buffer overflow uh, problem. So consider this uh, C code, very simple C code. Okay. Uh, anyway, buffer overflow is most of the time we're talking C. Yeah. Java um, to take advantage of buffer overflow is much more complex. Okay. Now C. Uh, okay. We have this code. What it does? What this code does? It uh, creates an array of uh, characters of size five. Okay. Uh, then it puts in it four T's. Okay. The last, the, uh, the last, the, uh, the last character will be what? The null one. The null character. <coughs> then we have an, another array of characters, uh, size eleven, containing containing ten A's. Up to now, everything is fine. So we have two different arrays containing one T's and other A's. Then we uh, uh, do what? We will. Copy. SQL copy does what? Copy string. Yeah. SCR copy stands for string copy. Yeah. String copy, you take the second parameter and you copy it into the first parameter. Okay. Now, attacker, it is uh, uh, how much size here? How many elements? 11. 11. 11. Size 11. Attacker size 11. And here are 16 D's. We'll override the. 16 D's, yes. So we are trying to put 16 D's into an array which can hold just 11. Okay? Now, if you do this in uh, Java, it will, complete. It will not yeah. work. Because it will uh, give you what? Runtime error. You will have a runtime error. Uh, exceptional. Now, here in C, it will be accepted. It is accepted in C. Uh, so basically here, if you override the data, uh, normally, normally, uh, only the attacker variable will change. Yeah. But check the next instruction. Here, we are, after we did this, we try to print the content of target, which is another array. Normally, we did not touch it here. We just put TTs in target, then we left it alone. We did not touch it. Okay? And then we just print it here. Okay? So uh, let's see what... Uh, if I compile this, um, 
So, uh, I have the code there, so it is, uh, I think, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, simple overflow, let's see. Here it is, this is the code, right? Mm -hmm. This is our code. Yes. Now, I will compile. So, GCC, simple overflow, uh, let's see, and dash O. I will put it into sim O. Okay, sim O. Sim O. Yes. Okay, that's some warning because of this copy, but uh, it, it combines. Okay. Now to execute it, uh, simple sim O. Okay. Yes. So what it shows you? No. It prints these. No. I have printed target. Yeah. Target contains normally just these. Mm -hmm. And I did not touch it. So here, what happened? Uh, I, I will try it also in uh, in Windows. To, uh, so so I th uh, this is this is the code, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the same code, and it is in uh, Visual C++. Then uh, if I uh, compile this, it is, uh, okay. Let's compile. It. Yeah, so here, uh, build build solution. Yeah, it is. It is compiled. Now, if I go here, it is the it is basic uh, BOF that exists. So basic BOF that exists, and what it prints there? Same thing. These. Mm -hmm. okay. Three only. Huh? Three only. Three. Yeah, I, I think the number of these here is different. I think yeah, the number of these here is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So here, what happened? The number of these is different than uh, there should be a T also. Huh? Yeah, normally now when we print, when we print the target, it should be T's, but uh, what happened is that when we print this, we obtain D. So here, what happened exactly? So basically we have, uh, we have our stack, okay, we have our stack, and then we had um, uh, one array which is uh, which is the um, attacker, attacker array, attacker, which contained normally uh, what? A's. Okay, so A's, 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 etc. Okay. Then we have next to it, we had a target, right? T's. So target. Of course, the stack actually goes downward. So, uh, yeah. Now, now uh, then we overwrote the uh, attacker. With these, so attack would be these, so all this would be overwritten with these, 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 and then since the size is uh, the size of the data you want to put is larger than what that array can hold, it will uh, go to the next uh, yeah, the memory location on the stack, which is the memory location of target, and it will overwrite. Okay. So this is, isn't here. It's not here. No, here these two arrays are. Allocate it in the uh, on the stack. To allocate on the heap, you need to do what? Here? M alloc. M alloc will allocate on the on the heap. Uh, when we allocate at the heap and when we allocate. At if the you uh, declare your array like this, it will be on the stack. If you uh, allocate it with uh, M alloc, it will be on the heap. Is there any difference? Of course. No, any yeah, performance or. Uh, okay, why do we sometimes allocate and give sometimes? See, if, if, uh, even in Java, even in Java, if you uh, do this, integer, integer i equals zero, it will be allocated where? On the stack. On the stack. On the stack. Now, uh, in, um, uh, uh, if you declare, uh, for example, uh, a string, string, a string, it's size, string so. s in, in Java, yeah. equals like this. It will be allocated where? It should not be in the stack. Huh? It should not be in the stack. The string itself is somewhere else, but the address of the string mm -hmm. will be in the stack. Okay. Uh, so basically, we keep uh, we keep on the stack the addresses, uh, some uh, key information. But in, in in C in C, if you declare your array like this, like a static uh, array, it will be on the uh, on the stack. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have uh, why is uh, the target uh, not uh, first? Uh, even 
I mean, here you can try. If you uh, if you put this attack and put it before, it will still work. But uh, do you first push the target, then you push the attacker. Uh, you don't know. I mean, how how it is compiled? The code. Um, uh, I don't know. Probably the uh, the. Um, the alphabetical, uh, alphabetical order uh, for, according to the address, it has you know, the compiler uh, and it decides about that. Now, uh, as I told you, we tried to, I tried to put this before and still work. Okay. It may happen that this is not at all. It might. It might. If, for example, the opposite, as I said, if the target is here, <coughs> if the target is here, uh, even if you overwrite, you overwrite something else, you not overwrite target. Okay. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the next point I'll discuss will work in both uh, situations. So, because, okay, uh, overwriting uh, another variable, yeah, you, it's nice to see, etc. But what can we do with that? I and mean, security-wise, it's... Uh, now we're going to see something which is security-related. Okay. Now... Yes, uh, I... Can I exploit the heap? Yes. Yeah, there are attacks called hip. Uh, no, not his frame. Hip overflow. Hip overflow. You know, the same principle can be applied on the uh, on the hip. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There. Yes. So to avoid this, maybe we need to declare the target last thing. This is yeah. This is no. You're wrong. This is the thing I wanted to say. Uh, we're gonna cover how to protect and the techniques to uh, to prevent this. To protect against this. Among the techniques, uh, basically it's called the um, uh, local variables reordering. So basically you have here uh, a target and target. To uh, override the value of target, target should be exactly here. If you reorder that, it, you know, the attack will not work anymore. Okay? So among the techniques is to go to the local variables and then reorder them in such a way, for example, what they do, uh, if you have uh, buffer uh, variables, like arrays in the stack, those, those variables, you're you going to put them on the bottom. So even they will override, they will override something else, they will not override the other variables. Okay? This is called variable reordering. Okay? So that when you override, you will, you will not uh, yani override the thing you want. Okay? Now, again, I, I, I'll be back to the, uh, the, um, the key part now. Uh, yeah, suppose, so this is not a full content of the stuff. The frame here, <coughs> this is let's say the method, the, the, some, some function frame here. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, here, this is the previous frame, right? This is the previous frame. So let's say this is the uh, main frame. Okay. Uh, if you have a buffer here, if you have a buffer, uh, here basically before that you had the uh, EBP, you have the uh, EIP, the stored one. Okay. Now, suppose you have here a buffer, like uh, this code here, it declared what? It declared an array of size 500, right? And then it does an STL copy. Okay. STL copy. So basically this is the frame for STL copy. And this is the uh, stored EIP to come back to the main function. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, if you have a, a buffer of, uh, of size 500, okay. this is 500, it will allocate 500. So this is a buffer of size 500. Now, uh, this, uh, this code, this code, it does what? It declares a buffer of size 500, then it will <coughs> put money in that buffer. RGV. RGV is what? Uh, it is the input of the user. This is when you, when you execute your code, when you execute this program from DOS or from the terminal, okay. you will supply the parameter in the command line. Okay, this is the, yeah, the input of the user. So RV is controlled by the user. Okay. Now, if the, if the user here, anything you, you will supply, it will be copied into buffer. Now, if you supply something of size 200, what will happen? It's okay, because the size is, is 500, we have, st we have enough space. If you supply exactly 500, <coughs> it's also fine. Right. Now, if you supply more, if you supply more than 500, it's what will happen? The, uh, so, no, here normally there are other things, right? There's some other stuff here. 
So if you uh, uh, supply more than 500, you start overwriting the values next to it. Now, uh, what you know, since the memory is going this way, you know, at some point, you can overwrite the EAP. And basically, when you overwrite the EAP, what will happen? You don't know some. You can point to some. You can control. Some code. Uh, uh, then, when the, the STR copy is done, you need to return. And then, with the, which information you need to return is this EIP. And since that EIP is overwritten by the user input, you can control that EIP. If you know exactly what is the offset to override the EIP, you can put there the address you want. And you can jump anywhere you want. Okay? Even in the middle of F statements. Anywhere, anywhere. You just supply an uh, uh, instruction pointer, an address of instruction pointer, right? Okay. So uh, here, uh, and uh, I will finish with this. So this is the, uh, the scenario. You have the buffer. You have the stored EBP, stored EAP. Uh, when we put more data than it can hold, okay, what will happen? You overwrite all that. Mm -hmm. And then the point is, you will. Uh, the goal is to overwrite the uh, the EAP. Now, overwrite the EAP with what? So here you can overwrite it, for example, if you if you get you want to get the DOS, the command line. You will overwrite the address of cmd.exe. Somewhere. It is loaded. It is loaded somewhere in the memory. Mm -hmm. You need to find its address and load to it. Or uh, jump to it. Okay? So basically, uh, with store, you will overwrite the stored EIP with the address of that common.exe and you will jump there. But the problem with this, the problem. We don't know the address. You might know, but it might not be stable. It might not be stable. This is one thing. Okay. Uh, now, a better, better way of doing this, this is the basic idea of uh, buffer over, or stack overflow, is to overwrite the uh, EIP with an address which jumps back to the same buffer, because again, we have 500. Yeah. So what you do, here, you can put some malicious code, the code you want, the code, for example, to launch the, uh, launch the comment, that exists, oh. and then you will jump to it. Okay. So basically, and the point is, uh, uh, can you can you put here uh, anything you want here? Yes, you can. Right. This is the yeah. user input. Yes, right. This is the user input. Okay. So you can put there any anything you want. So basically, you put the malicious code because here to reach 500, normally you would put, you put just A's, A's or D's or X's or whatever. Dummy, just dummy to reach to reach to 500. But here you can put something meaningful, something useful, which is the malicious code, and then in this address you place the address to jump back to that code. And basically, what happens here? The you have in front of you a server or some remote application and some some application. So if that application expects from you a certain input, you will supply a crafted input, very well thought input, so that you will override the EIP and it will execute the code you are providing. So basically you send a code to, the, to that malicious, uh, yeah. to that vulnerable application, and it will execute that code in the target machine, of course. So okay. this code is the shell code. And this code is called the shell code. Yes. And, and the, uh, when I supply this code, it should be in text, it should be stored in No, uh, it should be in, in hexadecimal. So basically these are, are assembly instructions. Assembly instruction, you write it in exactly because assembly instruction are, are hex. So and the good the, 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 the interesting part of this code, it is concise, it's small, and it is independent, it doesn't rely on anything. You just execute it, if you jump to it, it will execute and it, it will do whatever you uh, you want. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's stop here. We're gonna see a lot of uh, any details about this. this so the uh, stack overflow happened because, not because of mistakes, but because of details, yes. Details, but yeah. uh, I see this as a mistake. The language is kind of down. To it's not, uh, no, no. See, the, 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 the fact that you can uh, put data on some uh, arrays or buffers more than a goal, it has some good, I mean, some interesting uses in other scenarios. It is useful. Because, see, see. You have uh, more control of the memory. This will give you more control. In, in Java, you, I mean, you have an array of size x. You cannot put more than this. Uh, you don't have pointers. You don't have control. Enough control uh, on the uh, on the system. For security, is good. But I mean, C is much more 
يعني يعني is faster than 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 Java and it allows you to do plenty of things that in Java you cannot do. So it's trade off. It's okay. the, so let's call it a feature that has uh, some drawbacks. Yes, yes. But uh, the point is, is still, and yeah, still C is being the, the C is now is language number one uh, used uh, in particular in uh, yeah in uh, system programming, operating systems and very low level uh, uh, yeah, applications. C is number one still. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's it. Let's uh, let's stop here.